can hand up uh, welcome everybody um to our webinar on a feminist green agenda for wales thanks all for joining us today in what's been a very busy week of events for Hiteg, launching our state of the nations um report really grateful to everybody joining us today um in a moment i'll introduce you to um, the person i'm going to be speaking to this afternoon and you'll get a chance to ask questions of um and that is Judy James, our Minister for Climate Change. But before I do that, just wanted to reiterate why we're looking at this topic today. Some people might wonder uh, why we're discussing climate change in the context of um, a gender equal Wales. We all know that urgent action is required to uh, respond to the climate crisis here in Wales and also globally. And that's going to mean a very different approach to our economy and how we all individually and collectively live our lives. But our question is about how we ensure that this shift is one that delivers for all people, including women. And as well as tackling climate change, we tackle structural inequality. We know that women globally are often um, bearing the brunt of climate change, but seldom involved in decision making around climate change. Fortunately for us, not the case here in Wales. So how can we seize the opportunity to uh, deliver on a green, caring and equitable economy uh, in Wales? And, and, and with the strong focus that we have from Welsh Government on climate change and social justice, there is an opportunity to lead the way globally on this agenda. Um, and so I'm delighted to be discussing that today with our Minister for Climate Change, Judy James, who I hope is going to appear on camera as if by magic. <laughs> You are very welcome, Julie. Pranda, good afternoon, Gareth. So you and I have probably achieved the fact on some of these issues a number of times, and I know that you're personally and politically deeply invested in climate change and your um, current uh, position in the Cabinet. But roll back a couple of years, we were discussing the Gender Equality Review and Welsh Government's ambitions around making Wales a world leader for... Uh, gender equality and indeed I think it was said at the time the safest place in Europe to be a woman um, and we in that review talked about embedding mainstream equalities across Welsh government. Um, I guess the same questions apply in terms of how that's going around environment and climate change however big your portfolio is you can't do that all alone so <laughs> I'll be interested to talk um, as we go on how that's going but Firstly, I wanted to start with um, why we need a feminist approach to tackling the climate crisis and moving towards a, a green economy and keen to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Karis. And, you know, it very much is a, a continuation of a long, long established conversation, really, and a direction of travel, we hope. So, uh, you know, it's not going to be any surprise to anyone on this webinar that, um, you know, women are the vast majority of the global poor, that they depend far more on natural resources, public services um, and public sector infrastructure than men do. Generally speaking, these are all generalities or averages, if you like, but, you know, uh, very much the case. Around the world, insecure land rights make women and girls especially vulnerable to land grabbing by companies who are um, changing the purpose of land for you know, profit making um, palm oil plantations or whatever it is that uh, the current um, fad is that uh, removes quite often women and girls from the land or deforests the land or makes it less agriculturally fertile for uh, small um, and small scale and subsistence farmers and so on. So for us in Wales, you know, those things matter because we're invested in uh, both our international footprint and our uh, local footprint. So one of the things that I'm very keen to do is to make sure that as we, um, you know, work our way through the climate crisis and the things we've got to do here in Wales to change uh, how we behave, that we don't do that by making things worse for people uh, across the world. So one of the big issues I've uh, engaged with them. Um, organizations like Size of Wales, who I'm sure most people on the webinar will have also heard of, is to consider very seriously what our global carbon footprint and our global deforestation looks like, as well as what we're doing here at home. So to give you one small example of that, the way we currently measure uh, net zero, the, one, the thing we're all going for uh, for 2050, 
is actually what we produce in, by way of carbon here at home in Wales. So I could improve Wales immeasurably by shutting the steelworks. However, if I shut the steelworks, which is one of the most efficient and uh, carbon less carbon polluting steelworks in the world, I mean, all steel is carbon polluting, but um, then we would have to import that steel from other places in the world places that exploit women and girls in particular, that have very low wage economies, that have much less good carbon footprints. And we rely on steel for most of the renewable energy that we have. So, you know, the wind turbines that you see, the tidal energy stream, they're all made of steel. So, you know, there's no free energy in that sense. So we have to really carefully consider what we do here at home and what effect that has across the world. Um, and for you know the, the people living here, we have to make sure that we have uh, a, a, a fair gender equal, I would like to see, um, economy as well. So one of the, th the other things we have to consider is what will the effect of the change in jobs be? So as we come away from, um, so we're, we're using steel as an example, one of the things we're doing very uh, with Tata Steel at the moment is looking to see whether steel can be produced without uh, the use of the fossil fuels that it currently uses. And we're talking about a 10 year transition away from that. Um, what's that got to do with women and girls? You know, well, th that the stuff that we currently use to produce steel is mined in Wales and uh, across the world. Here in Wales, very few women are involved in mining, but across the world, a lot of women are involved in mining, usually on the most filthy end of it, the bit where they're, you know, cleaning the minerals out in, in very uh, unfortunate circumstances. So we need to make sure that we can drive change in that through things like we'll be familiar with the agricultural system, so fair trade and so on, where we have, you know, Wales has been a fair trade nation for a very, very long time, um, where we drive you know, uh, uh, fair fair trade, uh, but with cooperatives, mostly women cooperatives, actually coming together to give each other support, mutual support and benefit to produce the products that we all want to enjoy. Well, the same is true for those hard minerals. So we all want the batteries in our new electric cars. We want the battery storage for our solar panels. We want the wind turbines to move and so on. But a lot of those have rare minerals in them that are mined in very unfortunate circumstances across the world. And we can change that. The, the global rich can can, can change that. No, I appreciate that um, rich is a relative term, but relative to the global south, you know, this is a, a rich nation. So I think those kinds of interlinked justices translate to, to a different kind of policy for us here at home um, in terms of not only the way we treat our own people here at home, but the way that we influence behaviour as a government, the way that we drive spending decisions by people and so on to, uh, to drive some of those global changes that we want to see. And do you know what, Karis, we know that in most households, it's the women who hold the purse strings for that kind of spend. Um, and we know that we have to make those kinds of choices easy because they're economically advantageous as well as socially advantageous. So we have to drive things like a fair food policy so that people don't have to make poor food choices because they're, they uh, lack money, but actually you know, decently produced food is available freely for people. Um, we have to make sure that our homes are well insulated and the energy that we use to heat them is produced, you know, properly and without exploitation around the world and here at home. So it's all, you know, as we've talked many times before, is that we, this is a, a huge interlocking jigsaw of chain reactions depending on small decisions we make at home. So for me, the reason it's a feminist agenda is because women are front and center to that decision making process and you know are often uh, the influencer in the household for the purchases that they make. So that's the sort of starting point. But then there are a whole series of other things we've got a little time to talk about, I know. I just uh, do the plug for the book Invisible Women, which I know you're very uh, um, familiar with. Uh, so we've been just looking at things like transport and infrastructure systems and so on. And that book, uh, I know I've told you this before, I read that book, I had to keep going standing outside and shouting because I was so mad as I read it. But it has really seriously influenced the way that we start to make decisions about uh, prioritising public public service um, transportation, for example, uh, the way that we plan routes, the way that we plan, um, you know, public sector services, uh, it's really changed the way I think about it. So I always knew it was unfair, but I couldn't quite say why. And now I've started to really 
uh, be able to ask for the right data to make different decisions based on how can we benefit the majority of our population the majority of our population are of course women that leads um, me on to the next question so you've given an example of you know how we can actually drive that change using data and asking those questions but still too often and we said this in the gender equality review and you and I have talked about it before too often we see sort of departmental or thematic segregation by issues so equality sits over here environment here economy and business how can we change that and really disrupt that way of thinking so that we get the intersect between things like inequality and climate change or economic growth and social justice beyond just words and into practical action in the way that we implement change not just design policy because I think we've We've got that radical agenda and framework in place, but how do we actually drive that change so that it becomes something that doesn't seem to, because I think sometimes it just feels too difficult to people to, to make that a practical reality. How can we make it seem more accessible and like just the easy right thing to do? So, so I think for me, the way to do that is to theme some of the things that we decide rather than than so you know we're not talking about transportation we're talking about public services we're not talking about uh, the climate we're talking about particular bits of things that we can uh, get a hierarchy of decision making for so just to give another example um, we've been looking and I'm about to do um, something which um, my colleague Lee Waters unfortunately began to call deep dives and it's stuck so a deep dive into biodiversity uh, you know um, uh, there are lots of jokes available there about root and branch reforms and so on. But anyway, uh, a, a very thorough look at what is the situation in Wales with our declining biodiversity? What can we do to halt that decline? What can we do to reverse that decline and start to, you know, regain some of the um, some of the things that we've already lost, some of the species that we've already lost? Why does that matter? Well, it matters because uh, we have, you know, we face a serious crisis here we are starting to lose the ecosystems that produce the food that we eat and the air that we breathe you know this isn't nice to have we're talking about here um, and we need to be able to do that in a way that makes the right series of decisions about how to go about that so to use one just small example that we've been looking at for a little while now the Gwent levels in between Cardiff and Newport you could choose any other triple SI around Wales, but I just happen to have been looking at this one very recently. Um, so I convened a meeting of internal to Welsh government of all of the people who have an interest in that. Um, and, you know, the Gwent levels is between two cities in Wales, and it could be regarded as a nice open space where you could develop things if, if you had that sort of mindset. But actually, it's the green lungs of those city and, and for very large part of southeast Wales which is heavily populated um, and you know the, the biodiverse nature uh, that you get there the ecosystems that you have there are absolutely essential in producing the clean air that we all need in our cities now we know that a lack of clean air impacts women and girls most because they're the ones that are in the poorest housing they're the ones that are on the public transport system they're the ones with the worst vehicles and so on they're the ones on the street so you know you can bring that back all the way to if we can't sort out the biodiversity and protect the Gwent levels then we cannot get to a point where we have clean air in our cities either side because no amount of reducing emissions is going to be able to reverse that alone although having said that of course we need to reduce emissions and have other uh, polluter um, you know take other pollutants out of the air so I convened that meeting and the conversation went exactly as you described, Karis, exactly as you describe. How do we know what the most important thing to look at here is? Is it economic development? Is it conservation? Is it, you know, what is it? Is it uh, renewable energy? Is it whatever? So uh, in thrashing that out, I was able to get every single bit of the Welsh government into that conversation and thrash out a sort of pyramid. So the absolute top is you know hold the reverse of and change the biodiversity because that drives all the others you can't have economic development we haven't got any air to breathe so it was a really interesting example of something we talked about you're right in the gender review a couple of years ago about how do you drive that kind of conversation and one of the nice things about 
um, the way the new government is is put together, is that uh, Mark has deliberately put together a, a portfolio for me here that has almost all of those levers in it. Not all of them, because that's a whole government, but almost all of the big spending levers in it. And so I can drive some of those conversations. And then, of course, when we come out to do this deep dive, we'll be driving those conversations out across Wales to make people really think what is the hierarchy of decision making here? So one of the things that you've already illustrated in, in that example and just through the way that you've approached your portfolio is what a difference it has having somebody at the top at a decision making level who gets both those issues and is able to ask those questions and drive that change. But even though um, every global corporation will have targets around DSG or um, decarbonisation, um, net zero, whatever it might be, and we know that women are really effective change makers when it comes to climate change, very few women lead the industries that are the most polluting, very few women are in the positions of power and influence that you are making decisions that will actually change and have a positive impact on, on women and men's lives. How do we change that sort of gender segregation by in the sectors that could really drive change here? And how do we support and encourage the women to, to come to the top of those and join you at the table? Yeah, so that's the that's the age old perennial problem, isn't it? Is how do you make these things look less like boys games and more like things that affect us all? Um, and you know, a lot of that is to do with the way that we teach women and girls in school, the way that we, you know, all the stuff that we've talked about before about, um, you know, teaching teaching uh, science in a way that that demystifies it and doesn't make it look hard. Now, science is not hard. Science is really interesting. Um, uh, my particular bugbear is the way that it's perfectly acceptable to say that you're not good at maths. I, you, you know, Karis, I've had goes at people in front of you about that. What do you mean? Do you mean you can't count? Um, it's sort of, it's like a sort of cultural thing that it's okay to say you're not good at these things. Actually, almost everybody who says that is perfectly good at maths. They're just, uh, you know, taken on a, a cultural thing there. So my view of that is that we have to have a completely different and upside down approach to that. So we know that more women and girls are, are more concerned than, about climate change than, than are men and boys. Um, not a huge, you know, it's 5% more than, than men and boys. So uh, we're talking around um, sort of 79, 78% of women as against 72, 73% of men. But, you know, so, so, so there's a gap. So, um, my view of that is how what do we do then to empower those women to take uh, to have the idea that they can do something about it so one of the big things that we've been saying all the way through is that this is not a council of despair it has not yet gone to the point where we cannot get it back we can get it back that our individual actions matter and then the more of us who take a lead in it and start to really drive it up the agenda the better so talking to young girls in school as i've been doing an enormous amount over the last nine months since i took on this job you know they are really engaged and active in this so it's not a it's a very small thing to then say you know, you've been picking up all that plastic off the beach. Do you know how plastic is made? Are you interested in chemistry? Do you know how we could solve that? You know, just encouraging people in. And then all the good work, you know, Karis Akhwara Tate does in persuading people um, to have self, you know, the courage of their convictions, basically. Um, so, you know, your brilliant programs about how to get the best out of your career and out of your work. We need to be pushing all of those. And I am very keen on pushing an agenda across Wales that helps you know, correct some of those so, some of those things that, that happen to women when they're socialised in a particular way, not to put themselves forward and so on. And my biggest bugbear of all, as you know, and we've been working really hard, Kirsty Williams and I in the last government and Jeremy Miles and I in this one, to get more women into physics and, um, and science generally, particularly climate change science. So, um, so that we can have people who have, who get both strands of that at the same time. And then the last thing I will say, um, complicated answers, I know, but it's complicated to pull the jigsaw together, is, you know, to seize the opportunity of COVID. So COVID has been a long and dark two years. You know, with any luck, we're beginning to see the light, at least here in, in, uh, in Wales and in the UK. Not the case across the globe, of course. Um, but, you know, let's hope that we're starting to come out. To seize the opportunity that people 
really people really saw the difference when the cars came off the road they really saw the difference in air quality people really saw uh, the benefit of living in a, an integrated five minute community if you were lucky enough to do that and they really saw the disbenefits of not having that if if they were in lockdown in places where there weren't local amenities and we know that if we can make those five minute communities all over Wales in our cities and in our rural areas so places that are great to work and live and places that you can have global careers from you know without leaving your local community then we will really enhance the recovery um you know I don't like the phrase build back better because it, it doesn't mean anything what we mean is build back fairer build back more equal build back greener those things that's what we mean by better people mean different things um, this is our chance let's seize it so as we do start to recover as we do start to look at the measures we need to put in place then let's really push those agendas for decent green spaces to live where our biodiversity can recover alongside us and those things give women and girls better chances in life because it's easier to juggle all the things that women tend to juggle couldn't agree more and um this morning my youngest daughter was complaining for the first time I think in two years that she could hear the traffic it woke her up um outside her bedroom window this morning and then as we walked to school we had a really good conversation about how wasn't it great that we were overtaking the cars um who were all queuing up to drive into Cardiff and we were on our way on foot so yeah they totally get it um I'm going to come in a minute to the some of the questions that people on the webinar have posed and that's my little um, hint to anyone who's sitting on a question and wants to ask it to put it in the chat while I use chairs privilege to ask one more and it's a sort of um, classic question that chairs ask to put ministers on the spot. So you've shown that you're um, not afraid to take bold decisions around your portfolio already, you know, the things that have caught the public imagination around no M4 relief road, um, ceasing um, road building in Wales, national forest and so on. Um, what's the bold action that we could take? And I know it's you've already described it's impossible to pick one thing, but to give you a bit of let off, what's the sort of big bold action we could take as a government? But what, what are the top couple of things individually we should be doing to drive both the equality and environmental agenda? You might just give us your favorite. Yeah, so, you know, for me, it's about trying to make uh, uh, all the small things that we do every day add up, right? So, um, and again, in answering, in particular, school children often say, what is the point of me putting the plastic in the bin when China is building coal-fired power stations, right? So, um, so I say, well, actually, in my life, I've been lucky enough to know that the small actions that I've taken have had sometimes global effect. So, uh, you know, I'm getting on in years now, so I remember boycotting, boycotting South African goods, for example. Uh, it seemed like a small thing at the time, but it had a massive impact on what happened in in South Africa in those days. Um, I think it makes a huge difference across the globe when people make those small things work. So each little plastic bottle, each little plastic thing that you put in the recycling bin contributes to Wales's enormously good recycling target because we have that enormously good recycling target uh, um, recycling um, sorry what the word I'm saying we're already very good at recycling we're already at 65 percent we have a target of 70 percent so we can drive it up we now have a target for zero waste I can tell you that because of that individual action of putting that plastic bottle in your bin, I am now talking to global leaders on a world stage about how did we do that and how could they do it as well. And I'm also attracting really good companies into Wales who are interested in really good employment and so on to reprocess that back into things that can be reused in our community, bringing the green jobs that we would otherwise never have had if each individual had not put that plastic bottle in that bin. So I think that is one of the biggest things to say that each individual action that you take really does, you know, uh, magnify out. And then for us, just making sure that when we do bring in those green jobs and skills, that we bring them in in, a, in an equal way. We bring them in in a gender equal way and in a class equal way so that we have, you know, good routes to management. We have good um, employment opportunities. We have 
good systems in place to allow women to take advantage of them. So good care arrangements, good preschool arrangements, all the things that we know help in all kinds of uh, areas for um, getting women in particular into into employment. So, you know, I could list you a long list of things the Welsh Government is currently doing to try and get those things going as well. It's a continuum, isn't it? So, of course, we have to do all of those things simultaneously. But for me, it always comes back to don't belittle that small thing that you did that builds up into that big head of steam. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And again, not um, to make it all about my seven year old, but I've had a rant at my older daughter a couple of months ago about the number of plastic bottles in her room. And she said, well, they're, they're in, that's what you have in the canteen. So we talked about how many of the bloody ones we've got in our kitchen that she could take to school. And anyway, la last week, my younger daughter said, oh, we had a vote in the school council on getting rid of plastic bottles in the canteen. Um, because if you take your packed lunch, you take your own water. But if you have a school dinner, you get a plastic bottle. Well, how many hundreds a week are they wasting? Anyway, I promised to come to the Q&A. So we've got some questions. So this one is from an, an anonymous attendee um, who talks about the issue that's been reported in the press um, about the, the National Forest, which is a, she says, is a, or he says, is a great idea. But it's now been reported that several large polluting organisations are land grabbing to offset their carbon footprint. Um, is Welsh Government doing anything to stop this and therefore making the land available for community use, which is an increasingly popular way of living, especially for women? Yeah, so, so I've got a number of things to say about that. So first of all, um, we absolutely do have corporations buying up land in Wales, not quite yet at the extent that is being reported in the press so that's 16 percent at the moment but definitely happening um, that's behavior that's being driven in part by the uk government's um, carbon budget and emissions trading scheme we are in a four nation um, uh, decision making process to get a consultation out on the way that the emissions trading schemes work in the united kingdom because we come off the european model um, uh, which you know whether you think what whatever you think of brexit coming off the european model for that doesn't make any sense because obviously it's a much bigger carbon market but anyway um we're so we hope that that new emissions trading scheme consultation will come out in the next week or so uh, because part of what we're trying to do is make is is make that kind of behavior not worthwhile so um, you have to bear in mind what drives that. So these are these are global corporations trying to offset their carbon by buying up what looks to them like cheap lands to be able to plant trees, which is a carbon offsetting mechanism. So we need to make sure that we aren't driving that behavior by our own emissions trading schemes. Um, the other thing to say is that even if they buy the land, they cannot just plant trees all over it just to, to reassure people. So I know that's what's being said. But if you plant trees in Wales, you absolutely have to conform to the UK forestry standard. That means you have to you can no longer plant single um, species monocultural conifer forests, for example. You have to plant at least five biodiverse trees. The planting scheme has to be approved by NRW. Uh, it has to be, you know, there's a whole series of, of things that have to happen. And then in terms of access to land, um, we have actually funded NRW to buy some of the land ourselves with a view to encouraging community land trusts and other cooperative models of both living and working. We have sponsored through the Innovative Housing Programme three schemes uh, across Wales at the moment just to sort of prove that you can do it, which are forestry community schemes, basically cooperatives that live and work uh, in the forest. And just to say that the National Forest is a lovely to have for a whole pile of reasons. It sequesters the carbon. It promotes biodiversity but it isn't you know um it isn't it's it's iconic in the way the panda is for the world wildlife trust so you know a tree is a, an iconic thing in terms of uh, uh carbon uh, sequestration and recovery but just to say that it's part of a policy for our peatlands our, our uh, intertidal zones our um you know, our bog lands are uh, the lovely Gwent levels, you know, a whole pile of other things. So um, everybody always says, why just trees? It isn't just trees. It's just the, a bit like the World Wildlife Fund isn't just pandas. Yes, I agree. So we've had two questions that are grouped together, one from Roxanne Smith and somebody anonymous who both ask about women being disadvantaged um, in terms of accessing jobs in the green sector because of the high fees in 
higher education and the need, particularly in most jobs, requiring at least a, a master's level qualification. Um, and how can we remove some of these barriers to encourage women to have careers in climate action or green sectors that we want to create? Um, yeah, that's a very good one. So uh, a very personal view, not the government's view necessarily. I think individual charging of tuition fees is a very serious error. It is clearly a benefit to the uh, public overall. And, you know, the idea that you restrict it to people who can pay for it is just, you know, anathema as far as I'm concerned. We do have a different system of support in Wales than, than there is in England. It's designed deliberately to make sure that you maximise your income whilst you're in the higher education. We haven't been able to get rid of the tuition fees, frankly, because we simply can't afford it given the way that the UK government funds universities at the moment. Um, however, we have got a much higher proportion of grants than loan in our uh, support mechanisms here in Wales, because uh, we know from doing research that very large numbers of working class um, people, particularly women, drop out of university after they've got there in their first year, because actually they can't just can't afford to live. They can't afford to live there. They can't afford because um, so we've we've in, enhanced the grant aspect of that and up to the amount of maintenance that you, you get while there. We haven't. I absolutely uh, agree, being able to, uh, to reduce the overall amount of money that you've got to uh, pay as a result of that. Um, but we have tried to keep people in university to get them through that. Um, I'm, I can't do this without being very political, Karis, so I'm a politician in the end, so I won't make any uh, bones about it. The UK government's current attitude to higher education is awful. They, amongst the stealth taxes that they've just imposed, including a freeze on income tax levels, which means the poorer you are, the more, the quicker you're sucked into tax, um, is a freeze on the repayment points for student fees and the amount that you have to pay. And also, of course, uh, it's not a loan because loans have fixed interest or predictable interest. This is actually a graduate tax by any other name because it fluctuates alongside uh, a number of other things like tax does. I mean, I just, you know, we have a fundamental political difference with the UK government about the way that works, but Wales does not have enough money itself to come away from that system. I would that we did. So what we are doing is making sure that we consider which courses require the most maintenance, which, which ones we need for Wales, and how we can attract graduates to come and live and work here when they do graduate so that we can assist with the repayment of those loans and making sure that people get into good employment. So a complicated and not very satisfactory answer, one, one that I wish we did have the power to change more radically than than we currently do. I think one just again, chair's privilege. Um, one of the things that we could do within our existing powers is to be better at promoting and encouraging women in those sectors to be role models and advocates, yep. and you know, really talk about the the potential, the advantages and the great careers that you can have, just to demystify a bit what it's like to work um, in the green sectors. And I think you know, we and others have a role to play in that. Um, so can, can I just add to that then, Karis? I couldn't agree more. You've heard me talking about this before. Um, I've actually genuinely had to go at the BBC about putting something uh, similar to uh, Silent Witness on because the number of people who want to be forensic scientists after seeing those programmes is extraordinary. Um, I've, we've genuinely been looking for a way to popularise, to have some kind of murder mystery or whatever it is, uh, popularising some of the jobs that are out there. Um, uh, you know, and genuinely, we've been trying to publicise them through Careers Wells and other places, because how can you want to be something you don't know about? So how can your seven year old have an aspiration to be, uh, you know, a molecular biologist specialising in cellulose wrap? if she has never heard of that as a job so we absolutely have got to do more about publicizing the fact that you can have these careers and that many of them are available for people who live and work remotely or partly remotely and so on so i i do have a serious hope that the the other thing the pandemic has shown us is, is that flexible ways of working can really work in a much wider range of jobs than with other than was thought was the case beforehand a really good question here that I know you'll be keen to get your teeth into, um, again anonymous. So it says, we know some of the changes we need to make as individuals come with a greater time commitment to so walking instead of driving, buying sustainable food, using sustainable nappies. This could impact on women who are already time poor. 
how do we build that consideration into our work to tackle climate change and ensure we rebalance the burden of unpaid work? Hurrah to that question. Absolutely. Um, so completely, I, I completely agree with that. One of the ways that we can do that is just to make sure we have the best kinds of employment and, and um, flexible employment that we can manage. Employment law in general is not devolved to Wales. Um, so again, there are some things we cannot do, but uh, hopefully people are aware of the changes that we've been making in, in paying the living wage to care workers and all the rest of it. We've been working with our public sector employers, about 48% of employment across Wales is public sector. Um, and by the way, I make that's, you know, that's typically um, said that Wales's economy is something wrong with it because of that. But I, I, I urge anyone listening to this webinar to have a look at the, the public employment in Germany, one of the most successful economies in the world and you'll see it's about the same so uh, I make no excuse for that so what we can do is we can influence the way that public sector employment works so we've been working very hard with our public sector employees to introduce the, the real living wage right across the piece and to have more flexible working to have better home working allowances and so on we're not there yet but we are working really hard on trying to get there as fast as possible um, and also that kind of outcome-based work rather than um, presenteeism as it's called so you know um, understand what people are being asked to do and why does it matter if they do it at three in the morning if that's what suits them that kind of thing that actually is really helpful for, for people with disabilities and so on as well obviously and um, really just jumping to a question that kind of links to that um, you talked about the social care sector there's a question here around um, um, the foundation sector so is there any plan to include jobs in the foundation sectors such as health social care education which are already relatively green in the green jobs list and to improve the working conditions of workers and generate jobs in these sectors as part of decarbonisation and green recovery plans. Yep so very much so so one of the things that Julie Morgan has just announced is another payment to the care workers uh, at the top of the real living wage given the cost of living crisis that we're all facing. Um, we are very keen indeed to um, to bring more of those jobs back into the public sector properly. Uh, not, not, it's not because I disrespect the private sector, but because the public sector can drive standards in a way that the private sector simply cannot. So if you're competing in the same market as a good public sector um, provider of care, for example, then you will, you, you know, you just basically have to match the working conditions or you can't recruit. So we're really keen to do that. And then there are all kinds of other things. Your care workers typically drive, they um, typically don't have access to um, a car for work. Well, why is that? Anybody else who has to drive for work would get a car for work. So we're looking at other things we can do to assist, which will both help the individual with their living standard, but actually, you know, reduce emissions and all the rest of it. Also, I think that there's quite a lot of things uh, around there that can be done not at home, but remotely. So, you know, from local hubs and so on that um, that we can facilitate. So you'll know we've been working on um, having a local hub in large numbers of villages across Wales. So people um, don't need to actually stay home. Staying home has downsides as we all know, as well as upsides, um, but that can go a very short distance, hopefully using active travel to access a, you know, a, a flexible remote hub um, that they can work on. and giving access to decent broadband and all the rest of it, heating and lighting and all that, all that kind of stuff. So there's quite a big bit of work going on about that, Keris, so it would take me longer than our allotted time to go through all of it. But um, just to say uh, in, in finishing, that if anyone can think of anything else that they think we should be looking at or doing, please do say. I mean, we haven't got all the good ideas by, by a long shot. I'm sure people will take up on that. I'll try and finish on two short questions, which um, hopefully will keep us within time. So Kay Richmond has um, asked about the Commission on the Status of Women this year in March is focused on climate change. Would Welsh ministers take part? Um, I'd love to if I can. I don't know exactly she, when it is. And I think she also said, I think you would have lots to share and learn. So perhaps Kay will get in touch and, and send details of that to you. And then finally, um, maybe a nice one to end on, Athena asks over the last year what's been one of the biggest climate change achievements in Wales? What okay so we've, we've we've achieved uh, a fair number of things actually uh, which I'm very proud of so first of all the recycling thing so the move to the circular economy um, and zero waste Wales is a huge one we've started I hope people have noticed to roll out repair and reuse shops which um, are um, 
teaching the skills to do that yourself as well as bringing people in to help doing it so lots of little sort of community-based things as well we funded an enormous local places for nature scheme um, which has had uh, record numbers of people applying for it so that their communities can get actively involved in um, as I say reversing um, bio biodiversity uh, um, loss and then reversing it so at this point in time we're, we're concentrating on stopping the loss and then you know coming around to reversing it as fast as possible we've also managed to have the highest percentage of renewable energy that we've ever produced in wales enough for all of our own um all of our own needs if we could get the grid connections in place so my next big task is to get the grid connections in place so that people can come off off grid oil in our rural areas of wales and to decarbonize our housing so we've had a really good start at decarbonizing our housing we have something called the optimized retrofit plan which is a, a t test and learn process of figuring out what each type of house in Wales requires to bring it up to standard and then rolling up both the skills and the tech resources to be able to do that one size does not fit all Victorian stone terraces in the Rhondda need a completely different treatment to 1970s cavity wall built houses in North Swansea for example so we've been doing that for two years that's been really good and the last one is that we've managed to build more carbon neutral homes in Wales than anywhere else uh, so I'm really proud of that as well all these things help and all the little things add up Great, and it's very, very skillfully left me with two minutes just to wrap up and say thank you um, thank you for all your hard work and commitment to this issue and to trying to do the difficult and bringing together equality and climate change. And we'd be very happy to play our part and support you in that endeavour. And um, so thank you to everyone who's attended, who's asked questions. I'm sorry if I didn't get to them. I tried to bring in as many people as possible. I'm sure people will take up um, you on the offer of send ideas to Julie James in Welsh Government. Um, and hopefully this will be the start of a continued dialogue. So thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. No, thanks. real pleasure, Karis. And I do hope to hear from everyone. Thanks, everybody. Please follow the rest of the discussion on social media.